Okay, so welcome everyone to this afternoon session. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Irene Gamba from UT Austin. So Irene will talk about the global LP solutions of the Boltzmann equation with an angle potential concentrated collision kernel and then convergence to a Landau solution. Yeah, Thank you, Irene. <laughs> organization as, um, as I've been invited to, to contribute to the scientific committee. So uh, I can see it's an extraordinary event uh, for, for young people and I, and I hope many of the, the things are, are keep on happening as much as here as in the United States. And I said that because in the United States we do not have as much activity as kinetic theory as, as they have in Europe in kinetic theory. And uh, for many years, uh, and maybe still today, I have to travel to this continent to, to be understood more or less what I'm interested or I'm talking about while um, finalists are starting to pick up there. So it's a great pleasure uh, to see more young people getting engaged into these issues uh, worldwide. And it's an it's a interesting problem. You have heard a lot about the Boltzmann equation uh, so far and the Landau equation. So my introduction is going to be very simple, very, uh, you know, I'm not going to, uh, there are some slides that repeat what you have heard over and over and over again. And I will try to stress on the new aspects or in the different things uh, we want to address. Um, it's um, it's uh, clearly related, what I'm going to describe today is to the problem that somehow Laurent de Villette has been discussing uh, since the beginning of the lectures, and by now, I, I, he's fully embedded in the uh, aspects of the Landau equation. But he said suddenly yesterday that the way you get to the Landau equation is from Boltzmann. That's the way Landau, you know, Landau is, is, a, is a Russian physicist, uh, perhaps a Soviet, we would say it at the time, uh, or, or, you know, at the time he was a Soviet physicist. Uh, with obviously a very strong inclination in theoretical physics or mathematical physics. And, and he, he, he wanted to try to address the, the problem of how to understand collisional plasmas, as uh, was well articulated by, by Laurent. And the, the, you know, the, the natural way to thought about this problem is to use the Boltzmann formulation. I mean, as a historical remark, I'm not sure if if, um, if Laurent has uh, addressed it that way, I, I didn't see the, the first lecture. Uh, you know, when Boltzmann did his work in, in 1880, 1880 plus, in between the 1880s and 1890s, there was no concept of a statistical mechanics. People didn't understand that. The world was describing continuum mechanics and there were probability, and probability was very good to do game theory. That's exactly how probability was born and raised in, in France, as, you know, how do you get an edge when you gamble? But there was no concept of putting that into physics. And it's Boltzmann, uh, the first one that articulates it after following some work of, um, I mean, I don't remember all the names. Um, the particular one I want to say, I forgot it. <laughs> so, 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 um, uh, so it was quite interesting that while he proposed this model and, and the billiard model of Boltzmann, which is cumbersome, which we still keep on studying, and we still try to squeeze and dissect and understand every piece of it, it's, a, it's in a sense a toy model in physics, in my view. I mean, it's in, in a sense, it's a, you know, the billiard model is too idealistic to have, to be able to describe all physical phenomena. So you need to really move along, but it's very hard to move along if you don't even understand how to do the basic problem. For example, how would you do mixtures or mixtures in plasmas, electron ions in plasmas? How would you do it if you don't even understand the basic formulation? So, so in a sense, it's, um, it's, um, it's in, in, in the very much a spirit to see how can you really 
complete the, 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 the program that was initiated perhaps by Landau without saying it very specifically. The paper of Landau is very scant. It's written in a very physicist way. He quotes only one individual saying, you know, this reference is wrong and doesn't quote anyone else. He doesn't quote Rutherford, who was a British physicist, who actually made the first uh, measurements and quantification of how Coulomb uh, interactions by measuring the scattering cross-sections where particles uh, interact until and their active potentials. Uh, he doesn't quote that, but yet it's encoded that it's used in that derivation. He could not have done it without it. So it's, it's very interesting. It says, well, how, how can you come up with these connections in a way that is, um, you can say, something more rigorous from the mathematics point of view? Uh, historically, I browse by everybody, but let me, let me start by the slides that perhaps are the things that you have seen and heard, because it, it would be a common framework to start to work out and see where can we go from there. So, so, so uh, from the uh, Boltzmann classical point of view, a billiard model is exactly what you see at the billiard table, with the exception that there is no friction with the, with the table, and neither there will be a loss of energy after the balls interact. And it's very important that this concept of many atomic gases is identical uh, particles that are indistinguishable, and so you can do this molecular chaos. I mean, independently distributed and indistinguishable. If you don't have that answer, you really cannot even start with the reduction of the model. And so, so in the in the setting, it's, this is very interesting because the the only thing you do in this uh, model, in, from statistics point of view, a statistical mechanics point of view, uh, is just to say, what is the collisional law? The rest is more or less going to set up by saying, you know, the interactions are binary because the probability of seeing, you know, uh, three-body interactions are so low that you disregard them, right? And it's a reasonable answer if you have, in between the interactions, a lot of free flow or, or, or as, as it's well uh, phrased uh, by, by Boltzmann and, and, and all people have written about Boltzmann and I follow a lot, I followed a lot the writings of, of Giorgignani in this area many years ago, you have to have a lot of intercity space, okay? So if you have a box, there is a scaling of how big the particles can be, right, in the size of the box in order to get that this billiard is in an eternal motion, right, that could be going back and forward because it's a complete irreversible motion and, um, and yet you are successful to make sense of this particular model. So, so the, having said that, the interaction is going to be elastic uh, at the billiard level, exactly what you have heard um, and, uh, in, um, in, uh, in, in, in previous lectures. Um, and this is what usually would be called, uh, so when the particles touch, this is what we call a hard sphere, is when the intramolecular potentials become infinite. But there is the other range, which is when the particles are going to be subject to long-range interactions, which may be, you know, kind of forces that far away are attracted, but they, they, get, co they get very close, it's like this, um, uh, dipoles, and then tend to repel to each other. And these are uh, the case of what would correspond to Coulomb interactions. And so in particular, that, that, that uh, constitutive relation is not going to be changing from the fact that the particles are inelastic. It's going to be changing in the way you model the scattering cross-section. The scattering cross-section, as it was introduced in many of the lectures, and, 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 and I'm thinking more on what you've been systematically, Laurent de Villette has been describing, is you can call it, you know, the uh, collision cross-section, cross but it's the, you know, it's a transition probability rate of change. Because what the Boltzmann equation has been modeling for, for, for us is actually a rate of change in time of a probability distribution function 
which has, you know, which is predicting what is the probability of finding a particle at a position x with velocity v and a time t. So, in a sense, you can think that whatever it comes on the right-hand side, aside of those integrals and so on, they have to be reflecting this rate of change in time. Okay? It's like a balanced equation in conservation laws. Okay? So, so, so in fact, this is something that you have, as I, as I said, said uh, seen several, several times. Uh, the way, let me just add here a couple of uh, comments because I don't want you to get lost on notation very quickly. Uh, what we call here Q of F, F um, is an operator which denoted, I mean, sin in a binary form. We are going to be assuming that this is actually um, a sort of, you know, I, I, I have to say, Laurent, I don't, I don't like to call it a, a quadratic, a nonlinear operator. I think it's a, the equation itself, I mean, the problem, the nonlinearity gets into game with x into an action. But when you look just at velocity space, it's really a mixing operator. It's a, it's a very special bilinear form that is going to allow a lot of the magic to happen. Otherwise, you know, you have a quadratic term there, it's very hard to get good estimates out of it, okay? So, so, so in the bilinear setting, which we are going to understand, I mean, bilinear symmetric form, and so from now on is what I'm going to be using, I'm going to take that this object is symmetrized in this form, nothing spectacular, but perhaps what is more important that the object itself, right, written in bilinear form, is going to be an operator that will have some symmetry, and I will come back to that, and that's what we call the gain, which is something very, very important for the stability of the equation, and then it becomes a local form in F, multiply by, uh, sorry, let me call it a term that is non-local in B, and all of these have names, come from physics, uh, so, so what this is going to be is the integral of G being proportional to the transition cross-section that the physics is bringing to you, okay? That's something that it needs to be given to us in some, some way. So it's, a, it's going to be data, the constitutive form of what happens here, which is usually modeled as a function of the relative position or the relative speed associated to the particles. And the reason is that potentials between particles depend on that quantity as much as on the angle of interaction, okay? And so if I do that, then I don't have the picture here, but you'll see it very soon. So that means I have my V, my V star, and, and then you can actually do these drawings and, and in a very systematic way, given two pairs of velocity, right? So you draw the difference between the two of them. That's the relative velocity. The speed is the magnitude of that vector. It could be very small or very large. And then you draw a circle of that diameter. Sorry for not being so accurate geometrically for that circle. And then what is going to be random as much as you know, you fix V, you write on V. I mean, think of yourself doing a Lagrangian, writing in a Lagrangian flow. What does it mean? It's just sit on the particle V and move along and see what happens, and someone comes and bang with you, and that banging is going to come on any direction, any possible direction, which is V star, right? And, and it could be on, oh, sorry, any velocity V star, and it could be hitting me on any point of my sphere of influence would I be a sphere. Okay, and that means that it would be two quantities that are going to be rather random, average, picked up, you know, uh, aleatory, um, and that direction, you fix it, and that direction is going to preset the direction of the post-collisional relative velocity, and then you do this picture here, and you immediately pick up 
the collision law. And that is going to be elastic, because here you get D prime and V prime star. If you assume that this angle, you constrain it to be between 0 and pi over 2. Otherwise, you know, you're going to be assuming symmetry with respect to these rotations, OK? With respect to the upper and lower symmetry. So, um, so essentially, what this object is going to be doing, if you see, this is interesting. Here you get the V star. Then here is V minus V star. And then here is, this is a renormalization, U minus, uh, sorry, V minus V star over the relative velocity, C dot sigma. But this sigma, as I said, right, is in the same direction. It's the unit direction with respect to, so I'm, I'm, I'm rewriting it exactly as Laurent wrote it yesterday. This is in the same direction of V minus V prime star, because it was, I designed it to be the, once you have all this law, you can play with it and replace them and use them as you need them. There will be a lot of combinations of which you can handle this, you know, equations or manipulation of this uh, precise structure that is, is, is um, rising here. And then the absolute value of V prime minus V prime star actually is the same as the one without the prime because it's in the same diameter of the sphere. And that's exactly what actually makes it to be an elastic collision. In elasticity, we break that. Okay, although there is a lot of interesting stuff that you can do when you're doing elastic interactions. Mixture of particles that have different masses would not have that property. And then you are forced to use, to model them as, you know, systems of Boltzmann equation, and they would give you something that is, um, is uh, going to be different. Uh, you know, uh, something that it was going, it's going to be more like an inelastic type of uh, configuration. Um, it's interesting that, that when the particles tend to go to zero, right, even if you do, and I'm not going to get into the um, theory of inelastic collisions, uh, when, the, sorry, when the angle gets to zero, what is what we call the grazing collision angle, or when the particles are assumed to be under strong potentials, right? Because they are coming from far away. It is going to be, it remains an elastic interaction. What it really changes is that when they are getting close, instead of touching each other like the billiard table, right? They're going to start repelling, but that repel, the repulsion have to come with some little time that we somehow disregard in the model that is going to do a deflection of the particle. And then at the time of the closest range in between two of them, which they are not going to touch, they are basically moving in parallel motion. And then they depart again, okay? And that's why you saw the picture in the previous slide. So, so going back to this object, this is called the collision um, frequency. This is called the collision kernel. or transition probability. I like that word a lot. Because, you know, if you do uh, this type of models in a probability setting for multi-agent dynamics, for, you know, uh, describing, you know, um, wealth distribution, or whatever, they're not such a thing as collisions, but they are transition probabilities on what things, you know, how much you quantify what happened before and after the interaction. That's exactly the meaning. And then you decide what does the dependence on. And this is called the gain. So what is interesting is that when you write the equation, this equation, I'm not sure if this has been said or not, but I think it's, it's, it's very important. Maybe it was not said in the same way. Um, is that, uh, in my view, this is a typical model uh, or is associated to a, a master's equation that corresponds to what people like to call in probability chapman komogorov flows. Because what makes it to be very special is that they have, is exactly the, the, the uh, difference between two positive terms. The gain term is how much probability you are going to be taking in the direction of V 
but due to interactions, so you will see it read, and maybe you, 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 you saw it before, and so is the, is, you know, the, is to look at the, trans, the green of probability rate of my, I mean, all average in possible directions in V and, and in the sphere, that of particles that would take the direction V because of a pre, you know, pre particles that have interacted and go into V. While the loss is the particles that abandon the direction V. And so you can view this as a city like a birth death rate equation that appears all over in modeling of probability. And what it has the ability that by doing that trick is the only hope you have that if you are going to have some flow of multilinear nature, it can stabilize into something that is a probability distribution function, could be a sound, good sound um, uh, state in the domain of definition of the equation, or for which you can solve it in the name of space of solution. So, so, so the equation, as I said, have all of these properties. I will not uh, repeat them, but this is exactly what Bevillet has been describing in the last four lectures. Okay? And essentially, um, conservation laws are encoded here because you test by uh, one V and V square, and then you give you zero. I should say that there is an extraordinary uh, weak formulation. Um, did you introduce the weak formulation? Yeah, okay, <laughs> maybe. And uh, on which this become a trivial statement, okay? And that's very important. This is not so trivial. This is not so trivial. Uh, this inequality actually is due to the fact that the log is, um, is a monotonic function. And, and it's very interesting that perhaps once you write the equation, molecular chaos has been already settled. And if you read carefully, how do you do the factorization of endpoint probability distribution functions into, you know, single product of, or, or products of single point distribution functions is that it needs to be done, right, before the interaction occurs. It's like, you know, the particles are the correlated before they interact. And when they interact, once they interact, they need time to forget about what happened before, and so they can decorrelate again and interact with another person. That's why it's very important that you have a lot of intercitial space. And an intercitial space is a scaling issue, and that is a little bit complicated to, to go through details, but you know. Okay, so, um, so the, the, in fact, this, 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 uh, uh, this inequality actually encodes and clearly sees the fact that the sign here is not arbitrary, that what you get here is a local function in V, while here this is not local in V. This is going to be a double integral, all right? Would I have changed the sign that reverses this inequality? And then physicists have different way to interpret plus or minus entropy, but they are equivalent because what we like to call the entropy, they call it the minus and so on. But it has to be the sign that produces stabilization. And that, I guess, Laurent explained very well. So, so what I'm going to be discussing is a little bit the, um, the uh, uh, sorry, I'm not going to be discussing L L1K bounds, but uh, the description of the Boltzmann and Landau equation, the Grayson collision limit, um, the different class of Boltzmann equation, and in fact, more than, I mean, the Boltzmann equation is going to remain the same. What is going to be different is this. Right? Because it's quite interesting. And for me, it was a big surprise. And I will show you some calculations that you can, there is a zoo of transition probabilities that are going to take you to the Landau equation in within a range. And I will explain that in a minute. Okay? And then once you realize of that, and I said, well, you know, we are all debating how to approximate the Landau equation. But it looks like you can do it from many, many you know, ways of assuming how the particles are going to pass from one state to another, right? 
And so that is actually something that was very telling for the work we are going to be focusing, which is, I try very hard to do it with the existing cross-sections. Can I actually show rigorously that the solution of Boltzmann, um, and this is in the space homogeneous setting, converges to a solution of Landau? That uh, question was uh, addressed yesterday. It was proven by Villani and Alexander in the sense of renormalized solutions. But renormalized solutions is an analytical tool. I don't think that has been explained in this course, right? I, I, no. It's, it, it, it was an analytical tool proposed in the late, late 80s, early 90s which actually allowed to construct the form of solution, which was good enough to satisfy conservation of mass and momentum, but it's not a classical weak solution. And part of that is that the conservation of energy as much as conservation of entropy, and uh, entropy uh, decay as much as entropy bounds, remain open for that type of solution. So, you know, the natural thought is, if you do, if you do, and that is a, is a true statement for um, that is a true statement for the space in homogeneous setting when things depend on x as much as when x the, when, when the space the, when the solution only depends on velocity space, which basically says well all particles are the same. I should I should say it by now when you write the Boltzmann equation, particles are not any longer spheres; they are point masses. And the radius of the sphere has been scaled, of the particle itself, has been scaled with respect to the number of particles in order to obtain a constant that appears, you know, in front of this object. Okay? So the space homogeneous setting would be something like that, perhaps with a constant, and that constant of no order of one has a ratio that depends that given the size of a box, how many particles of certain size can you have in a box in order to get the correlation, okay? And that is the, usually is, um, is uh, it was calculated as what is assuming the Boltzmann grad limit. When you do this calculation, the number that results here is the, uh, called the Nuxen number or, mean free, or associated to mean free passes, how much you can fly in between one another interaction in average. So, so um, existing theory, I will actually revisit it and I will propose, I bring to your attention, not propose, I'll bring to your attention a new way to get existence of solutions for the Boltzmann equation. And, you know, we have the existence of Archeride and then, which actually gave rise to a lot of work that came up after it. And it's, in a sense, if you read, I mean, if I, I have to say, when I read Arcarit for the first time, it was extraordinary. How can anyone do that? Very hard object to read. And, but it had something that was interesting. He's trying to build up a Picard iteration. And for that, he has to work a lot in how to make this Picard iteration. And he was trying to use the concept, I mean, he, 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 he needed the concept of entropy. By now, we realize you can actually remove that condition that you need bounded entropy. And, um, but what is very interesting, it was pointed out in 2006 uh, by Bressan, in a, actually in a summer school here in CISA. Um, and he presented the, how to solve the Boltzmann equation for hard spheres. And he writes a statement, I mean, he gathers all the estimate, writes a statement on the theorem, and the, the, the statement that he writes, you'll see it later on, he checks uh, some of the points, it's very straightforward, but there's one point that was very subtle, he says this is a trivial statement. It, it is not trivial, it needs to be an extra work. And, um, and so, because of that, I communicated with Bresan. He came up to my attention that everything was encoded in Martin theorems for ODEs. And he said, you know, and he says in his notes, anyone, probably CISA should have them. I mean, they are posted on the website, and I have them, and I quote them, and you can find them. They are basically the Boltzmann equation. You need to solve them in a setting when this is an ODE in a Banach space. 
This is not the way you do classical PDEs in divergence form, where things are in Hilbert spaces and you have an extraordinary theory for that. Banach spaces, as you, we all know, are much subtle to work with. And that's exactly the, the point that I'm going to So in this particular setting, you see it's very simple because we gave the existence in L2. And then we need, I want to describe the existence in LP uh, the existence in L1K, we still have uh, some issues because of the nature of the cross section and the, and the you know, and the particular uh, cross section I'm going to be choosing for the Landau equation. But if, but if you take the problem, classical problem for hard potentials, when you split, right, when you split, this object into a function of u times a function of u hat dot sigma. And for instance, you assume, by now you can assume integrability or not, but that is, is going to, 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 to think, I mean, this could be integrable or not, so let me put it plus in this or this. If it is infinite, you need more conditions. I will not touch that today, okay? Um, so let me just say what, what it means in the classical setting. And on phi of u, you can actually put here, imagine putting a constant times u to the gamma, and here a constant u, a capital C u to the gamma, gamma between zero and one, uh, what you get is that the uh, L1K estimates, are gained or are created, which means you can start with with uh, set L12 and the solution, you know, the Boltzmann operator actually will bang you, you know, uh, solutions that are going to be in L1K for any K, which is quite an extraordinary uh, event. Uh, and we know much more on that. Uh, and, and if B, and if gamma is equal to zero, and remember that, I will somehow come back to this. Then L1K estimates only propagate. So this is a, you know, it's an interesting result. I like to, I, I like to always pass at this point and, and, and there were a series of work very nicely developed by Laurent de Villette and Bember in the, in the early 90s, when they made obs an observation for the, yeah, you were a baby. <laughs> you were the age of the student here. Uh, where the observation is that, you know, as, as we all get estimates in times, you always have to find some inequality in the norm, right, as a function of time for which you can get bounds. And, and what they observe at, at different times um, uh, Laurent, I think you, you did first the propagation for all case, uh, and then, and then uh, Bember realized that just tweaking a little bit the calculation that, that, that Laurent did, you can actually go into, into uh, generating them. It's like, a, like everybody likes to call about the De Georgi theory. Maybe you, some of you have heard about it, that you start with very little and you get a lot out of it. Okay, so the Boltzmann equation has that property. Instead of saying, you know, from L2 you pass to, to bounded, here from, from L2 you pass even to say, not only that you have L1K, but you add all the moments. And that is also going to be true. And so you have, you know, exponential uh, tails being said as much as you would have pointwise bounds in L infinite. But you can do that if this is split, okay? And if it is positive. When you are on zero, things are going to be propagated. And in fact, uh, this is going to be crucial for the fact of the L1 
Cape Bounds, but I'm, I'm not going to talk about it because we are still uh, twiggling it. I, I tell you what is the difficulty when we get there. It's going to be very interesting, I, I hope. Okay, so again, you've seen this picture. This is my drawing. This is what we call, so here, the, the, the Vs and V primes are below, but you have all this diagram. And it's very important that if you're ever going to work with Boltzmann, right, if you don't learn it in the first two, three weeks, my advice is just work on that until that comes from the skin, because it's really needed. It's really needed. You need to always refer to how the interchange of the interactions are. So, so, so in particular, the collision cross, the, 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 inter, the interaction law or the collision law can be written in the classical way, which is, which is they conserve center of mass as much as the relative velocities. In fact, that is, this, this interaction here says that the two radius cross in the middle and that vector that appears in the middle is center of mass and it's the same for the pair VV star as much as for the pair v, v prime star. You read it from the picture. And the other statement says that in fact the four, the four um, magnitudes square of the velocity vectors, right? V, V star, V prime, V, V prime star, lie on a sphere. So it's a lot of a stiffness from the geometrical point of view, okay? So it's a, this is not an arbitrary uh, kind of uh, um, interaction. So, so the other interesting thing, and this becomes crucial to understand what we'll be doing, is that this interaction law can be actually written in a different way, which this is another thing you really want to get under your skin because all the estimates actually operate at this level. And it's to say that the post-collisional velocity, okay, is going to be equals to the pre plus an object, right, which is proportional to the difference in between, you know, the, this so the vector, this vector in these two directions multiplied by the magnitude of u, and here you have it with plus, and here you have it with, uh, with minus, all right? And essentially what this is telling you that you can actually rewrite this interaction by uh, modifying a little bit the two vectors that are going to be orthogonal, and I'll go back to that. So, so, so now I'm writing what I, all I said, so I'm going to move forward. This you have heard a lot about it. Soft potentials is this range. Not very soft potentials. These sometimes are called not so soft potentials. The first time I heard that word was from Laurent. I have never heard it before. <laughs> right, right, right. You have been around my, my kinetic life uh, since more than 20 years ago. <laughs> and, um, but then it comes another one, which are the very soft potentials. And the very soft potentials, when you do, you know, all of these quantities and numbers really depend on the dimension. So, so if we're in three dimension, a very soft potential means the dimension, so the potential has to be in between minus the dimension minus one and minus the dimension. And when you hit the dimension, at that point you are lost. Why? Because you go back to this point, if the cross section is splitted, you put here u to the minus three, right? Absolute value of u to the minus three. You are calculating then here, right, a convolution because suppose that the cross section even is constant or integrable. So the cross section here, you would have that a convolution of g with u to the min with v minus v star. So it's u v star, v minus v star, u to the minus three, and that is not integrable. And that is what motivated, I mean, Landau to, well, or at least I know people probably figured it out earlier, but they didn't know what to do. But the Landau approach was to say, there is only one way out of it, and it's to do, to use the collision cross-section. And in fact, I can actually do it on this drawing now, so when you see it, you know what is coming, right? Basically, what you can say is, you know, I have a bad singularity with respect to this term. Okay, so what can I do? I mean, after all, I have my collision diagram, I have my birth and death rate, there is nothing else, I have no more room than this binary operator, and so what I do know from here is that if I look at the distance from any point, 
from say b b v prime to b to b as much as b prime to b star prime these are going to be identical this is a little rectangle that you saw before this is going to be exactly the out this is basic trigonometry high school the sine of theta over 2 and so there is one thing that can save you and it's the fact that if this is going to be very large right well you can make this very small right i mean actually sorry if this if this is going to be going to zero because it's i mean this u to the minus uh, 3 is going to be very very large then uh, this is going to be to zero or this is going to be to zero, and then you somehow need to use that these two things need to be very close. Okay? All right. So all of the things are coming up. And so, and so, the, the, so the way to do that calculations is exactly what we uh, started to study, and this everybody has studied this, which is essentially to look at the, at the sphere and I start to focus how I'm going to be absorbing something that is extremely singular here, all right? Well, the first observation is, okay, let's see what you can do by using this object here. Well, if you let me write now what is this object here, right? This is going to be f of b prime G on V prime star, and when you want to look at the, and I like to put them in the back, because they are pre, and I remember they are pre, okay? They will be paused in the weak formulation. Uh, and, and that is going to be also proportional because you do answers of symmetry for getting here, always the same form. All right? And so the only hope that you have is that you're going to be comparing these two terms, all right? And by looking at how the solution may be differing from V minus V prime as much as from B, my, B star minus V star prime. And so you are forced to integrate the flow into a whole single configuration. Okay, so uh, one observation that I should say you know, sigma is a vector on the sphere. Which means you need to decompose this into two directions. So I, I draw it on the, on the flat, you know, on the plane. But this is an object that is actually evolving on the sphere. And so what happens is this angle here is theta, which is the theta here. And so that basically says that sigma is going from now on, when you start to write off the scenes, you basically said, well, sigma is going to be a vector, a unitary vector, that has to have the direction of u with respect to the cosine of theta, right? Because I'm going to be defining that, which I haven't said it yet, u hat dot sigma, you define it to be the cosine of theta. And that starts to frame, you know, how you put all of the things together. And, but then, you have another direction, which is my azimuthal direction with respect, to, um, with respect to the polar. So this is, you may, you may think that this is the polar angle with respect to u. And this is then the azimuthal direction with respect to, uh, to u. And that means that u is orthogonal to omega. And so, you know, this is a local configuration because you have the interaction, you look what happens with u at that point with the letter u, right? And then, and then you have to think of that frame. And whatever you do, you're going to be doing a calculation and an integration, and I should say that I, when I finish this, Calculation now, I can, you know, somehow dissect it. I'm going to be integrating in R3 times S2, and here is a minus. And then now I can really talk about, well, here there was an integration. I forgot my F of V. And then here I have 
d v star d sigma for this big whole form. Let me put a bracket and a bracket. Okay? So, so, in fact, what is going to be extremely important to derive the Landau equation is not what happens with the polar angle. It's what happens with the azimuthal angle. Because if you, if you remember what, what Laurent has been showing you, the Landau equation doesn't have any angle anymore. It only remembers u in a very specific form. In fact, it is, it is the u in the projection with respect to the azimuthal direction. That's exactly what has to be coming out from this calculation. Whatever you do, it is really the fact that if you properly do an expansion here with a single purpose to absorb this you know, Coulombic interaction, the single purpose to absorb something, to be able to say something about or reduce the singularity, when this object is u to the minus three, okay, the only way to say that is because this object depends on the cosine of theta is to perform very careful azimuthal integrations. You know, maybe I'm saying something that is silly or stupid, I don't know, that you may have heard or, or, or maybe physics knowing from day one, but, um, but it's something that one has to really keep in mind very much. Okay, so again, keep this picture in mind. Um, so the, the Coulomb potential uh, was actually not even addressed by Boltzmann. Uh, yet in 1911, it's a British math physicist that did a lot of calculations, and in particular, he measured the cross-section or interaction rates for Coulomb potentials. His name was Rutherford. And he said something, okay? I'm trying to put it in pieces. Nineteen eleven. so Boltzmann, is 1888, right? I mean, about that time is when he does the equation, maybe earlier, 1828. That's a lot of work. And uh, he died in 1906, actually. Very close to here, as you may know. Uh, he died in Duino. Uh, yeah. So, um, so Rutherford says, you know, the, the cross section, the angular part of the cross section, measured as a function of the scattering angle in terms of the, of the polar angle with respect to u, should be a quantity that is of this form uh, to the fourth. And then, you know, if you think that these are it's a differential, it's a rate of change with respect to the variation of the angle. This is something that in, in three dimensions, the, 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 transfer, the transformation, uh, the Jacobian transformation will give you an extra thing, this, this theta. Doesn't say much. I mean, even you look at the pictures, yes. This comes from... No, this was from experiments and measurements. And actually, and that's my understanding. Well, okay. I tried to read rather far. I'm not a physicist, and it's hard to tell. And it's very hard to distinguish at the time physics from mathematics. It was not the same bifurcation that you have these days. Yes. something similar when the, when the interaction is not based on uh, charge? Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, okay. Uh, you know, that, would, that perhaps would take me uh, to think about how to answer okay. uh, first. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and then uh, probably much more time would I want to spend. But, but they do this with measurements. And what they can see is to look at the deflection angle that they observe at the time of interactions. And this is done by particle colliders. Ah, 
Yes, how, how Rutherford did it is well before particle colliders, okay? So, so but, but what is interesting is that the measurements, and he fits something like that, and it goes into the, into the, into the, I mean, or puts up a law that maybe nowadays we translate it into something like that. And I want to, to put a caveat here, okay? All right, so I need to speed up. I'm actually going very slow. But, but what, what is keen is a very singular decay. But what is clear, that what Rutherford said, and in any experiment even today, there is a, a frame or an horizon on which have no information any longer. You cannot resolve zero angle, okay? So you have to negotiate with some sort of cutoff or, or, or answered, okay? So, um, so, so in fact, what then Landau said, the equivalent is somehow, I mean, it's not quite Landau, and I need to speed up, but was after perhaps the well-articulated work on the gong and Lukin, that if you take that the cross-section is going to be, actually now I'm taking the whole B, all right? And you assume a parameter, okay? And that parameter is going to aid a little bit or, or quite a lot what you have. So let me put here the cosine theta and or, or I can write it as a function of the sine of theta over two. So you can see after the transformation that takes you from cosine theta to sine of theta over two. Uh, it has to be an object, and they write exactly this. And here you get one over sine, and I want to leave it that way, d theta. And then in this, um, and there's one other thing that needs to be said. You need to actually cut off, so oh, this is sine of theta. Uh, you need here to cut off the angle, so you can said, I know nothing, or I assume that there will be no contribution for the transition probability if I actually get into, you know, angles which are smaller than two because I have no information, but it has to be compensated, and this is what Landau says, and I think it's an extraordinary observation. He says, this alone would not make it, but there is something else, and he divides, and he divides by an object which is the logarithm of the sign of epsilon over two. Not quite like that, but you can read, you know, you can put the pistol together. And so I'm going to explain you why is that happened and why it's successful and why we make it with a different one. In the limit, what they all compute is the Landau equation as Laurent explained in it, all right? So, so different collision cross sections. Well, the classical Rutherford is exactly what I wrote for you here. And in particular, and I'm going to show you very fast the slides now. I mean, you, you, you can keep them later on. But, uh, but uh, so that is the Rutherford, right? But it turns out that physicists, when they want to compute Landau and they want to use their Monte Carlo codes, they said that computing Landau with Rutherford potential, it takes forever, whatever that meant. Right? I mean, you know, when people, numerical analysts sometimes may talk in a jargon that says, what does it take forever? Well, the forever is this object. Because this is going to be the rate of decay, and that's exactly what Lukin and the Gon showed, heuristically, that the rate of decay of solutions from actually the decay of the collision operator to the Landau operator is this one over the logarithm of something that goes to zero, and it's very, very slow. And then physics said, well, actually, you can do better than that. Increase the singularity, right? And if you increase the singularity, you converge faster, provided that you actually change here this rate. So what this rate here is nothing else. It has to be now a function of delta that is going to depend on the sine of epsilon over two. That has to go to zero right, as epsilon goes to zero. But, but what is very interesting is that you increase the delta here, and then what I personally discover, maybe, you know, and then it was very easy to cook up much more uh, functions, is that what you have here 
is nothing else than a primitive of an exact integration of the collision cross-section in the sign of theta over two. So you really have to work a little bit like a physicist and do the calculation. And then once you have this primitive, what you are dividing is by the value of the primitive evaluated at the sign of the cutoff value. So for instance, if you put here delta, and delta actually can be zero, but cannot be two. This is rather four. And this is no way to control the tail. OK? And so that was actually very interesting. For the first time in my life, I realized, wow, you can get there as many cross-sections as you want, at least a single family, one parameter family, OK, on this delta parameter. And then it made me think that then I'm actually looking at the problem, maybe like people is trying to prove that Navier-Stokes converges to Euler, right? I mean, there are many ways that you can get, even from the Berger's equation, that you can regularize right, the viscous Berger's equation, and you always recover the inviscid Berger's equation. Isn't that, are we in the same sort of a scenario? Who knows? Uh, you know, later or earlier, I mean, this is something we did a few years ago, but certainly in between after looking or approximately about the same time, Laurent de Villette, and then it was worked out with he, they actually indeed realized, perhaps you, Laurent, knew this, uh, try a completely different cross-section, put a different answer, scale it properly, and you pick up Landau. You do the formal calculation, and you pick up Landau. And in fact, we actually did, I mean, and let me show you what is the difference in between the, the Devilet versus the Rutherford potential or cross-section. The Rutherford says, look, if you have no information what happens for small angles, I assume that there are no particles colliding with that angles. That is zero. If I assume, and Devilet says, if I assume what happens below a certain angle, I'm going to say that they collide more and more and more and more. And you put infinite diffusion there, bang, and you put concentrate a lot of interactions. Okay? And um, I should say that uh, there was a, a nice paper of, of he in 14 where he actually shows that you can pass to the limit and he constructs Schwartz solutions in the Schwartz class that converge to the Landau equation. Uh, I'm not sure if the convergence is, is a fully rigorous uh, calculation. It's a lot of estimates. I can never get the guts to get into that, but I, I expect so. But it's local in time. I says, can you do any different? So uh, let me say this is the history and so on. Uh, this is what I want to show you, that why we actually computed all of these objects, and it was by using the Fourier transform. And this is where I discovered that you had a very beautiful problem that perhaps would remain open. Now, someday, maybe close. We actually did a, cal a numerical calculation on how to, co to approximate Landau. And we used it by a Fourier method. And if you do it by a Fourier method, OK, I know they have no internet, and I'm not sure why the machine Keeps on saying these things. Okay, so so what happened is the following. So so you do this uh, approximation and, and 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 understanding how you are going to manipulate the integration on the sphere. But if you do in Fourier space, something quite rather spectacular happened. The Landau equation, the Fourier transform, uh, of, uh, I mean. The Fourier transform of the Boltzmann equation is a convolutionist Fourier space, but it's also the Landau equation. And the difference of both of them, if you write them in weak form, is exactly the same um, object actually acting on the sort of weight of the Landau equation versus the weight of the Boltzmann equation, whatever comes from the cross section. In this case, you have an angular contribution. In this one, you don't. Okay? And so, so, uh, and so basically what we were able was to come with this calculation, doing all this uh, class of possible cross-sections, we were able to say the following. I mean, this is really a cheap theorem, okay? It says, if I assume that my solutions of Boltzmann are strong enough to say that the Fourier transform of F times its shift, its own shift, all right? 
is bounded by a quantity that essentially comes up to say that the solution of Boltzmann would have, would have at least you know, two derivatives or three derivatives and decay with cubic tails, then, then you can actually get a decay rate to equilibrium from Boltzmann to Landau of the operators, not from the solution, okay? Just the operators. We try like hell to work into that, and I put Sona to work into that, and we go nowhere. Five minutes, two minutes, okay. So, so, the, so in any case, uh, let me just wrap up because of the fine work. So, can I, can I have three more minutes? <laughs> so, so, basically, what we got here is that, um, so, for instance, if you compute the Landau and you put the Rutherford potential, this is what you get. But if you put the uh, a quintic potential here, so you take delta equals to one, then you get something much closer to Landau. So, the first question is, what is Landau? It's really the physics. It's ruder for the physics flow. Maybe ruder for has the physics, and so it should be that. But the difference between one and the other, and as you browse in changing cross sections, is that you change the rate of decay of Boltzmann to Landau. Both of them are going to converge to the, you know, to the statistical equilibrium that are going to be Gaussian. The, the convergence doesn't have a spectral gap. There's a lot of understanding about that. But If I average to that, it forgets completely about the potential. I put gamma here minus 3, and that is gone. What I get is the average of that is 8 over epsilon. It's just the scaling survival. That is very important. That is, you not, do not succeed getting line now without that scaling. Right? Well, the choice of your potential could be very different, but something has to push it to, to compensate in the expansion. So, so essentially what you get then is to deal with an equation that behaves like Maxwell molecules, but it's not. Because in the Q plus operator, you still have this big, uh, you know, this big enchilada, as they call it, right? It's a mess to look at that. What is that? I mean, does it look like the Rutherford, like the Devilet interaction? Well, it looks like this. I mean, just look at this part of the picture. I mean, I just took it from another slide. Okay, I didn't have time edit to do. But basically what this one says, if I don't know what happened for a small angles, I assume that I keep my last observation. Okay? And that is actually going to be moving as, as, you know, as you get epsilon to zero, what that minimum, because you have the one over epsilon, this starts to be raised, and then you pick up in the limit the u to the minus cube. All right? So it does the job of approximating lambda. So we did the calculation, and in fact, this is something that we were able to get. It's quite interesting, and I give a lot of credit to Sona to have read every single line of uh, the first part of the paper of Laurent, which uh, he, he discussed today, and, uh, and come up to the understanding on how to manipulate LP estimate. But I just want to focus on this particular uh, the, well, the Cauchy problem is the, is the Martin theorem. I'd like to also credit to Bresan for realizing that it would work here, although he, he didn't use it itself, but it worked. We have used it for quantum Boltzmann equation. We are using it for, for wave turbulence, uh, uh, for stratified flows, which are integrals equations in wave theory, and it works like a charm, as, as people would like to say. Uh, the other observation, uh, this theorem would not need to use entropy. And then the other observation is the following one. And this follows, well, that's part of the things you need for the proofs. 
and the subtangency condition, but that's right. Um, and so let me go into this slide. Uh, just a word. That's for Michael. I hope you like it, Michael. <laughs> this is something that uh, I was actually thinking, how do I explain this in two slides? Um, so with, with Alonso and, and Carneiro in 2010, what we did is we actually cal started to revisit it and try to get Young's inequalities for the collision operator. That was have done by Gustafsson and, and many, many other people in the, and, and Villani and Muho. Uh, uh, but what we did at the time was extremely careful estimate that, first of all, take a convex combination of exponents, a la brush can live, a la, a la loss and live, right? And, uh, and then uh, regroup them accordingly in a way that you can actually get a good hold of it. And so what you observe is that these parts here are crucial because they are encoding your cross-section. Now, my cross-section now my mu is going to be this Dirac delta. When I do the integration with respect to the sphere, this mu gets replaced by the minimum, right? By actually one minus mu gets replaced by the minimum between one and this Coulombic interaction rescaled by epsilon. So one over epsilon will come out, you see, but this one is going to be very nasty and this one is going to be very good. And then you have to work like hell to get this actually come up to terms. So in the classical split case, you recover the, the uh, Young's inequality. What was new in our work with Carneiro and also is that C was exact. And that was what got me to be able to do the calculation for this cross-section. And in the search of that cross-section, I realized, and I will not go to the details, yeah, I have to finish, that I need to actually to And the trick was, and I finish with this, the trick is that you start with any LP function. It's going to be the initial data that you want to put on Landau, okay? Could be infinite, could be not, but could be something. It has to be an LP. It actually works for an infinite solution. We are finishing all the details, um, and it's going to come very soon. Uh, I need to assume, because of that nasty cross-section piece, that in an epsilon interval, which depends only on gamma, on the Coulomb interaction, okay, I have to do a correction of this function. So I'm going to take in this, it's a subspace in LP, because if this function is in LP, this is also in LP. And so before Alessio kills me, then I actually say, trust me that that works, and I get then the equivalent to an, uh, the Young's inequality, but with a negative weight. And this is actually interesting. I'm, I'm trying to see if it is removable, it is needed. I actually get better than minus three, and that worries me a lot. So, but I cannot get, you know, I cannot, if it is a, an issue, I cannot find it. And, uh, but there is a weight, and that is because of this negativity. And so, and so with that, then we can show uh, gain of integrability by recent work we did with Maya Tascofi and, and Ricardo Alonso, which allow us to come up with a maximum principle and get a full control, which the data is going to depend on the initial data, but in the limit, you're going to lose the initial data. And then in the last statement is the convergence, and I will not say more than, in fact, we can actually show that if I have an initial data in L12 and L1P, L log L, then I can actually construct a solution in LP epsilon minus 2P, and that in the epsilon limit gives me a weak solution of the Landau equation in the classical sense. And that, that conserves mass, momentum, energy, and makes entropy decay. And uh, with all of that, I actually thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.